Okay. And her mother went crazy. She couldn't handle it. We judge the adequacy of what we have in comparison to others. And you can say it's a moral failing, but it's not. It's just basic human behavior. Hey guys, thank you everyone. We're actually quite privileged and honored today to have Juliet Shore. She's an economist and she's also the professor of sociology at Boston College. And she's also a famous writer. Uh, her classic book, The Overspent American and The Overworked American. And actually, we're gonna talk also about her most, most recent book, um, the After the Gig. Um, but actually, one of the reasons why I wanna to talk to you, Juliet, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, when I told my friend, uh, true story, by the way. I told my friend that I was going to interview you, and I told I told my friend what your book was about, the, the first one, The Overspent American. He said to me, Alessio, I like her already. So, <laughs> so I want to ask you, Juliet, for people who haven't read your book, I mean, I mean the first uh, the first two. So I, I I really want to talk, I'm talking about the Overspent American because that's the one I really found interesting. Could you just explain for everyone in a nutshell why the, the central message of your book, uh, in other words, why the, what, what was the most important message from that book that people can gain? Why is it that people spend so much money on things they don't need, they don't save any money, and you know, uh, I guess most people are just broke most of the time? Yeah, so there are two parts to the work that I've done on this. One is the, work, mm -hmm. the working side and the other is the spending side. And I'll start with the spending because you asked about that first. Sure. So the the sort of bottom line of an answer is that we spend to social expectations and there are tremendous pressures on people to move with everybody else. And so what happens is that people adjust their sense of what is normal, what they really have to have, you know, what what's kind of expected by the people who are around them, either in real life, or one of the things I showed in this book was uh, for people who watch a lot of television or now are involved in a lot of social media, the friends that they have online um, can also influence their spending. And so it's there's really a kind of defensive dimension to it in which it's not that we're, we're what used to be called in America, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses so much. We're not trying to get ahead of the Joneses so much as to just keep up. And I think that keeping up process is really key. So one of, the, I, I found there are two things in my research from that period that I think, you know, may be worth mentioning now, because I think they're still important. One is that people whose friends and what we call reference groups, so the people they look to, to sort of set expectations about spending, People whose reference groups generally had more money than they did, so their friends and family and others, um, saved less and spent more. People who had reference groups who tended to be, you know, a bit below their own financial status, spent less, saved more. Hmm. So the whole idea is that it really depends on who's around you and yeah. that we're we're really social beings when it comes to understanding spending. Now, this is a radical departure from the way economists think about it, because for economists, we're all individuals and our own preferences are not affected by other people. In fact, they sort of almost always assume uh, in, you know, autonomous preferences, not non-interdependent. So that that's the first thing. And the second is that that process changes with social changes. And what I argued was that beginning in the 1980s, so that book came out in the 90s, so it, it's yeah. a bit dated now, but it, it's just as relevant now. Beginning in the, the 80s, as the income distribution started getting more and more unequal, people were more likely to look higher up in the distribution. And that's a period of time when they were actually watching on television, movies, so and eventually social media, where lifestyles of the you know rather wealthy are disproportionately displayed mm -hmm. so there developed what i called an aspirational gap between what people could afford and what they wanted and that was really driven in large part by those changes in the income distribution and then a sort of media environment that really advertised the way the upper middle class and the wealthy are living that's very interesting. So if I can just put into some concrete terms, uh, Juliet, as an example for everyone. 
so as an example, let's say a couple, um, you know, middle America, I guess, or even in, in the UK where I'm speaking from. So this can apply, I guess, in Europe and also in America, I guess, where a middle class couple, maybe earning about $100,000 or 100,000 pounds a year combined. And they look at their working friends, they look at their colleagues who are working around them or their friends on social media, as you say, or celebrities. And some of these people are earning much more than them, maybe twice, triple their salaries. And they look at what kind of lifestyle they have, like cars, I don't know, jewelry, houses, you know, places they live. And they say, oh, okay, that's what I, that's what I should be living like. I want to live like that. I, I should be like that, right? So is that my right? So basically what they do is they spend more money out of their wages to be more like them, to keep up with them. And if I'm not mistaken, you're, all, you're also arguing they have to work more hours to pay for those luxuries that they can't afford. That's true too. And I, they're, they're, yes, let me just start with the spending side. So that's absolutely right. Uh, there's a book that I mentioned in my book called The Millionaire Next Door. Yeah. And it, it had a, you know, it, it got a lot of attention in, in uh, circles of people who were sort of interested in financial independence or how do you make money and save money and so forth. And The Millionaire Next Door was the perfect example of what my research showed because these were people who became millionaires, but they lived in the same houses that they had purchased when they were working class or middle class. So they kept their friend groups. They kept the same neighbors. And so they really didn't spend that much. They saved huge amounts of their money. And that's why they were the millionaire next door. You wouldn't know they were a millionaire because yeah. they didn't upgrade from the Camry to the Lexus. Um, <laughs> But when you, but if you move into a, a community where if you're a Camry driver and you somehow manage to scrape enough to, you know, get a house in a community of Lexus drivers, you're going to want that Lexus. Yeah. And the, the, uh, so, so that's, it's the social, it's your social context that drives your desires. So how does work come into it? You're right. People work longer hours to make more money. But there's also another basic dynamic that has been going on in the American economy and the British economy to a lesser extent in Europe. But and that is that if you take the period since the Second World War, so much of our productivity growth went into uh, producing more things rather than giving people more time off. So it meant that it developed what I called in the in my book, The Overworked American, uh, the work and spend cycle. Yeah. When we when we ask people, would you rather have a raise or more time off? Mostly people were saying more time off. Their employers were not giving them the time off because employers generally prefer the longer hours. They don't want to hire more people. So people would get their raises instead. They go out and spend those raises. When you ask them in the next year, they they would say you know, they they didn't they wouldn't want to give up the money that they had gotten, even though a year earlier they would prefer to give up the money. Yeah, they'd rather take the time. So every That's year right. people's preferences adapted to what they had gotten, mm -hmm. and so um, my little ask so it's like a, it's like a vicious that, cycle, I, I guess, Juliet. You know, you earn yeah. more money. Now you, your desires now jump up. Oh, I want to get this other more expensive stuff I can't afford. Right. And for a lot of people, it also meant going into debt, which meant you didn't have the option to work less, even if your employer had given it to you. But mm -hmm. what I argued is, you know, standard economics says people get what they want, that they have these preferences, they make their choices, they get what they want, everybody's happy, the system works perfectly. I said they end up wanting what they've gotten so that their preferences adapt to the hours of work and income. Uh, you know, they may want more of everything always, but the, the point is that they adjust. And so this is how you get a system in which people are continually not getting fr free time, over time getting more and more. Now, eventually the company stopped giving raises to people. Um, so that, you know, that, that era ended, um, but, more inequality leads to longer hours of work, uh, and it leads to those frustrated spending desires to debt and so forth. So that that was kind of the the story of overworked and overspent American. That's right. And um, I'll tell you what, what kind of sh 
like because a lot of people, some people watching this video are going to say, and I and I understand why they might say, they say, well, Alessio, um, this is not new. They might say, Alessio and Juliet, you know, this is not new. Uh, we knew this. Of course, people are going to do this. But I think that's not correct. You're actually saying something very important here, which I think may, people may may have missed. And, I, and correct me if I'm wrong here. I think what you're saying is, okay, so, so let me just break it down. Some people on the left, politically left, they might they, are, they usually say, well, the reason why people live in po poverty and why the reason why people can't afford things is not because it's their fault. It's just because they're not, you know, an unfair, an unequal system uh, politically, and uh, just people are the system is rigged against them, and people are not earning enough. So we need to have a more distribution of wealth. I guess it's more on the left argument, you know. Um, Tax the, tax the rich more and spend more on the, on the, on the poor and the middle class. That's that's one argument the left makes, and then, and then you have the right, uh, polit political right, who say, well, um, no, it's it's not it's not uh, government, it's, it's not it's not corporations' fault, it's the individual's fault. Everyone has a responsibility to spend. They want, you know, they, they're responsible for their own lives. They should spend, they should save more money. And I'll give you an example of this, Juliet. Every time I read Wall Street Journal or I read Market Watch. They're continuously every week. They, I remember every week they used to mock and ridicule middle class people for not saving enough money. But they, they never actually explained, like you have, the reasons, the causes of why people are not spending enough money. So am I am I am I correct in saying this, Juliet, that what your book essentially exposes is there is a culture. Our culture is driven in such a way, or, or the reason why people find themselves in this kind of mess, this vicious cycle of spend, spend, work, and spend. It's not just because it's their fault. It's a cult. It's the culture around us, as you said, um, celebrities, social media, the people who work around us. You know, working hours. Could you expand more on that? Am I on, am I on the right track here? Am I am I wrong? Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. It's a really important point because for the for the right, consumption is all about a mora mora individual morality, right. and when you know the the. They blame every downturn on the uh, on immor immoral behavior by individuals. They took on too many mortgage commitments. They have too many credit card debts and so on and so forth. And they fail to understand that if, if you want to explain why people do what they do when it comes to consumption, you have to understand that it's profoundly, as you say, cultural and social. And it the structure of the society, and in, in, for this issue, its structures of inequality especially are really important for understanding. So, in in more equal societies, people save more. In more unequal societies, they save less. It's not just about some individual uh, thing. So, here's an example I like to use to, to so to, uh, which has to do with how we understand a, a particular consumer item, or let's just talk about a house. Yeah. And I'll personalize it because I had a, a one of my students years ago, who I was working on these issues with her. This was when I was teaching at Harvard. And she told me a story about her family, which was they lived on a street in a, a suburb right outside of Washington, DC that had built had been built at a time when most of the houses were pretty small. Her house was the biggest house on the street. I mean, it wasn't that much bigger than the other ones, but it was a bit bigger. And her mother especially was so proud of her house because she could lord it over. She was bigger than all the houses around her. This was a period of time in which real estate values were going up a lot, land values rising, people came, were coming in. They were buying these little houses, tearing them down and building big houses. And somebody came in and bought the house next to hers and uh, proceeded, you know, to tear it down and build a house bigger than my student's family's house. Okay. And her mother went crazy. She couldn't handle it. <laughs> she spent years trying to, you know, going to court, the government trying to stop these people. But that house coming next to hers made hers smaller. Because oh, it was okay. all about the relative position, because the value of the house to her was not so much what the house was itself. Her house hadn't changed at all, but suddenly her house wasn't adequate. 
because what we think what is adequate for us is always in relationship to what other people have. We call it relative income or relative consumption. And there's a lot of evidence. That's that, you know, what I said earlier that, you know, people's reference groups affect how much they spend and save. That's the basis of it, because we judge the adequacy of what we have in comparison to others. And you can say it's a moral failing, but it's not. It's just basic human behavior. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, yeah, we're kind of human, like oh, everybody sorry. else. Yeah. So that's what's really key. And so when we have a culture, as you said, which is sort of pushing certain kinds of behaviors it, it, or expectations, it, it spreads and it spreads either on media, it spreads through interpersonal connections, et cetera. So as a society, we need to pay attention to, to what, what we are, what our culture is doing in terms of things like consumption. This is why many cultures in the pre-modern era have something called the evil eye, which is uh, mm. restrictions on people showing off too much. Oh, this right. idea that if you show yeah. off too much, bad things are going to happen to you. Yeah. But it was a very um, functional way of keeping a, a little bit of a lid on on sort of too much ostentation, too much. The term I use is competitive consumption. If yes. you have too much competitive consumption, you get really bad social outcomes because everybody's just running harder and harder to keep up and we're all pretty much just staying in place. And that's where the working stuff comes into it because we actually have to work longer and longer and longer or take on more and more debt to keep up. Is competitive consumption different from consumerism, from this culture of consumerism? Is that a different thing or is it similar? competitive consumption it's, well consumerism to me is the belief that sort of consumption makes you happy it's a kind of ideology it's mm -hmm. you know it's it's the idea that this is the purpose of uh, of your life or this is what a society should be organized around mm -hmm. etc competitive consumption is the dynamic which uh drives consumer uh behaviors and what's really key for understanding how much competitive consumption you have or the form that it takes are things like how unequal is the distribution of income and wealth? What is the media landscape? What is the debt landscape? That's another thing, because that allows for more competitive consumption, even if people don't have the purchasing power. I mean, they don't have the money themselves. They can borrow it. Thank you very much, Juliet. I won't All take right. too much yeah. of your time. Wonderful really appreciate it. Thanks, Juliet. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks.